All right, take your Bible this evening and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse number 14, and I'll read through verse 18, and you follow along with me in your Bible there if you would. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, where the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as he hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I want to talk to you tonight on that subject from verse 17. Be ye separate. Be ye separate. Let's pray. Father, take the truth now this evening, and Lord, I pray that You would help us and open our understanding tonight as we look into Your Word. Uh, Help us, Holy Spirit, as we look at this important doctrine in the Bible and what we ought to be and what it will mean to us in our relationship with You. So Lord, give me clarity as I bring the message and Spirit of God, open the understanding of people that they'll grasp the truth that we have before us tonight. May You guide us and lead us and direct us and teach us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, I, I don't believe there's any way I'll get all this done in one, one shot, okay? So this will probably be a two-parter. Uh, so you won't get all your blanks filled in tonight, I don't believe. And uh, so we'll, just, we'll go as far as we can. Uh, then we'll just unhook the train and uh, unhook the cars and We'll pick them back up next on Wednesday night, all right? But uh, be ye separate. You know, someone said sin that used to slink down the dark alley now struts down the main street. Christians are less separated from the world than ever before. And, And the reason that is, is we're looking at the world instead of looking at God. Yeah, I've illustrated this several times through the years. I'm going to illustrate it again tonight. All right, and um, let me let me use Brother Xavier. You come up here, would you please? All right, Brother Brother Xavier. All right, he's gonna he's gonna be the world. Okay, he looks kind of worldly, doesn't he? And uh, no, he doesn't. He and uh, but he's gonna illustrate the world. Okay, and and I need. Let's see. He used to he used to do that, huh? All right, good. This isn't confession. Okay. All right. And um, we, it'll be the world. And, and listen, uh, I'll represent a Christian. All right? Now, listen. God says a Christian is to be separate from the world. Okay? Should a Christian be here? No. We're to be separate from the world. Okay? How many understand that, that uh, where God is and where the world is are totally different? Understand? Uh, they're not the same. In fact, if you're a friend of the world, you are the enemy of God. The Bible makes it pretty clear. They're, they're, they're opposed to each other. Okay? So, God says, when I save you, you're coming out from the world and you're being separate. All right? But now, let me ask you this. We just talked about how things that used to be done in the back alley are now right on Main Street. Things that used to be... We were watching the baseball game last night. And some commercial for a jewelry store came on, I think. That's what it was showed diamonds and such, but they didn't show a man and a woman. They showed two women. I took them off and I said, what was that? Honestly, that's why I said, what was that? I said, are you kidding me? They're advertising that. That used to be a shame. Used to be when folks did that, you said, oh, they came out of the... Yeah, there's no closet anymore. It's on Main Street. So the world, world getting better or the world getting worse? Okay, the world gets a little worse. Okay? The world gets worse. But now listen, if the Christian isn't focused on God, God and God's Word never change. 
Okay? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I don't keep my focus on Him. If I don't keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of my faith, but I look unto the world, well, I just move over a little bit. Wait a minute. Am I still separate from the world? Sure. Okay. But the world gets worse. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Am I still separate from the world? But wait a minute, wait a minute. Who used to be here? So now, am I worldly? Absolutely. That's why you see things going on in churches now that I grew up in church. I've been in church over 50 years. I know, hard to believe. (laughs) I've seen things in churches that I cannot believe go on in church. Because I remember when the Christian used to be here. And they weren't over here. And now things are acceptable. and things, You know why? Because, well, we're still not like them. Yeah, but we're where they used to be. And this, 30 years ago, was worldly. So is our standard we look to the world? And we just keep the same distance from them, no matter how bad they get? What happens to another generation? The world gets worse. You know what? They don't even recognize biblical Christianity anymore. People who hold to where they always have been. Stay where we always should stay. Believe what we always should believe. Look back and say, man, what what kind of a weirdo are you? No. Be ye separate. Be ye separate. The one we look to is God, not the world. So that's the difficulty, and that's the trend we see with Christianity today. And they drift over to where now we're doing stuff the world used to do. You know what that is? That's worldly. Okay? Thank you, Xavier. You, you were, did a great job being the world. Okay? All right? That's just the illustration you've got to keep in your mind. Now, Paul is crying out to the Corinthians. They were baby Christians. They were carnal Christians. Okay? All kinds of difficulties in the church at Corinth. And, and, and his heart goes out to them. Notice verse 11. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11. O oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open to you. Our heart is enlarged. You are not straightening us. We're straightening, you're straightening your own bowels. You're, you're, you're holding yourself back. I'm not holding you back. You're holding yourself back. Why were they holding themselves back? Why were they restricting themselves? He said, now I'm speaking. He said, for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also, what's the word? Enlarged. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to enlarge you. I'm trying to help you grow. And how's that going to happen? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He says the way you're going to grow, the way you're going to enlarge in your Christian life is to learn to be ye separate. They were hurting and they, they weren't growing. They were still baby Christians. They were still in the, walking after the flesh because they would not be separate. And so he's trying to help them here. He's not trying to hurt them. You can see Paul's heart is, a, has, is speaking to him as unto children. And he's trying to, trying to help them. This isn't hard as nails. This isn't unloving. See, this isn't like, oh, he's trying to just put the whammy on us so we can't enjoy anything. That isn't what, what he's talking here. It's a tender heart from a man whose heart is almost breaking because he loves these people. And he wants God's best for them in their Christian life. And so... He, he's telling him, you need to make a clean break from the old crowd. You need to make a clean break from the people that still pull you back to the old way of living. Those who would, who would still take you back to idolatry. Those who would still put you back in the sins of the flesh. Separated from the worldliness that's in the world. You need that. Now you need to know something, that separation is a doctrine. 
And you need to know that Baptists, for years, Baptists from the beginning have been known to be separatists. We believe in separation. There are verses you'll learn tonight and verses you'll see tonight that, that you could sit in some churches for years and never hear. You could listen to some radio preachers for years and never hear them. I had a couple one time come to, come to our church and we've taught along these lines about separation and they had been in a Southern Baptist church for seven years and they sat and said, we have never heard those scriptures ever. Seven years in a church. Separation, number one on your paper there, separation is taught throughout the Bible. Separation is taught throughout the Bible. It, it, when he says here about being unequally yoked together, it goes back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 22. And I'll read that verse for you. It's Deuteronomy 22 and verse 10. And it's just a short verse. You know what the Bible says? God's telling Israel, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. God called that an unequal yoke. Dr. Rice said, when an Israelite farmer hitched up his team, he said in his heart, God commands me not to plow with a mixed team. I can plow with two oxen, I can plow with two donkeys, but I can't mix them because God wants me to remember I'm not to mix with people that are not God's people. And he would remember that even when he's plowing his field. They would remember it even when they put on garments. God said, you don't mix the the wool with the linen. You don't mix the different kinds of material. And he's just doing that as a constant reminder to them. Remember, he would tell Israel, you're a peculiar people to me. It means you are, you are uh, particularly mine. You're a, you're a treasure of mine. And you're not to be like all the other nations around you. That's why God gave them some of the things that he gave them. And so he's saying here that it's taught, listen, separation is taught from one end of the Bible all the way to the other. And it begins with God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 with me, will you please? Isaiah chapter 6. We'll come back to 2 Corinthians. You can put something in there if you want. Isaiah 6. Right away, some of you know, that's where Isaiah saw his vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Notice what it says in verse 1. I, I, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And cried, and one cried unto the other and said, what they say, church? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of His glory. The, the word holy, both in the Hebrew and over in the New Testament, in the Greek, have the same root word and it means to be set apart. It means to be separated. To be set apart. Holy. So you, you could say, what they're saying here is, these creatures, seraphims, before the throne of God, day and night, are saying, separated! Separated! Separated. You know why? There's no God like Him. He's separate from all other gods. There's no one like Him. And so God in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Be ye therefore holy, for I am holy. Be ye therefore separate, for I am separate. You see? When you begin the doctrine of separation, you begin with God Himself. He's separate. And you have to keep that ever in your mind, ever before us, His holiness, His separateness. The Bible calls each one of us a saint. A saint is not somebody who the church decides is going to be a saint. Okay, uh, A saint is one who is set apart. That's the definition of a saint, okay? A holy one. You're set apart when you receive Christ as your Savior. Get your Bible. Let's look at some scriptures, okay? Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. 
What does the Bible call us when we get saved? Saints. What does the Bible call us when we get saved? Saints. Saints means set apart ones. Okay? Set apart ones. Romans 1 verse 7. Paul's writing to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Called to be saints. You, you'll see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just keep right on going to your right. Right after Romans is 1 Corinthians. Notice, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, verse number 2, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Where the Bible talks in, in about know ye not the unrighteous in verse 9 shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God and such were some of you but ye are washed ye are what? Sanctified. You're set apart. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Right after 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Notice verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You'd notice Philippians starts the same way. The book of Philippians right after Ephesians. Paul says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. He does the same things in Colossians. You can go right on through. 1 Thessalonians, Hebrews. Look, at, look over at Hebrews chapter 10. Will you go there with me? We'll skip over a few of those other ones. Hebrews chapter 10. Notice Hebrews 10 and verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We're set apart by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Notice verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified sanctified means set apart you go down to verse number 29 of Hebrews 10 of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace again we are we are saved where the blood of Christ was shed we by faith trust Christ our Savior that sets us apart. We are sanctified. We are set apart in the eyes of God. And we're to be saints, all right? So, separation is taught from the beginning of the Bible for the Jew and then all the way through the New Testament, certainly for the believer and for the Christian. And so, number two on your paper is this. There needs to be a clear difference between a child of God and a child of Satan. And, and, and don't, don't think that's harsh, okay? Everybody in the world is either a child of God or they're a child of Satan. Before you, before you were saved, before I was saved, I was a child of Satan. Not, not being mean, but I am being biblical, okay? You'll see that here in just a moment. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, would you please? 2 Corinthians 6. Notice the clear difference here that, that is being used as uh, Paul speaks to these Corinthians under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the words he uses. He says, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with what? Unrighteousness. Then he says, What communion hath light darkness? There's a big difference between light and dark. There's a big difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. Then he goes on to say, What part or what concord hath Christ with Belial? 
Belial is wicked, wicked men, wickedness. What is Jesus Christ who is light and in Him is no darkness at all? What does He have in common with wickedness? Absolutely nothing. They are complete opposites. Okay? You see the difference that He's making here? He's saying you, the, there ought to be such a clear difference between a child of God and a child of Satan. He, he goes on to say, What part is he that believeth with an infidel? We know what a believer is, one who has faith in Jesus Christ, one who believes the Bible is the Word of God. An infidel is not just an unbeliever. An infidel is someone who does not believe in the inspiration of the Bible and does not believe Christianity, period. That's an infidel. What, what, what similarities does that, that person have with someone who says they believe the Word of God and they believe in Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. Nothing in common. Okay? There's a clear difference between a child of God and a child of Satan. Then he says, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? The temple of God. Hey, the temple of God was for who? It's not a, it's not a trick question. Yeah, it's for God. David said, remember? David said, hey, you know, we have these big homes to dwell in. God doesn't have anything. We ought to build a house for God. Remember that? Well, you don't remember it. Remember reading it. And, and he says, yes, God ought to. And so we built this, and Solomon built it for who? For God. This is for the worship of God. No idols at all. He made that one of the Ten Commandments. Don't have any other gods for you. Don't make yourself any graven images. There's nothing in common at all. Two completely different purposes compared to the places that were built to worship idols. Completely opposite. Completely different purposes. So, wherefore, verse 17, come out from among them. Well, who's them? Okay, it would be the unrighteous, the darkness, the, the wicked man, Belial, the infidels, those who worship idols. You'd come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. There's a few other scriptures to look at. Look at John 5 and verse 24. John 5 and verse 24. Aren't you glad you have a Bible tonight? Amen. John 5 and verse 24. Jesus speaks, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from, what's the last three words? Death, death unto life. What's the, what's the contrast here? Death and life. You can't, get, you can't get more of a contrast than death and life. Okay? Look at John 8, 12. Jesus again uses the analogy that was used in 2 Corinthians. John 8 and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Again, he's using that parallel of light and darkness. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5, he uses the day and the night to show the contrast between the child of God and those who aren't the children of God. But I want you to look at 1 John chapter 3. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John chapter 3. You go all the way to Revelation and you come backward. You'll have Jude, then you'll have 3 John, 2 John, and 1 John. Okay, 1 John 3. Look at verse number 10 with me, will you? 1 John 3, verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. The children of God are manifest, and the children of who? The devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. You notice how he, he how did he divide the two? They're children of God, and they're children of the devil. That's, there's, there's something in our human nature that doesn't like that too well. Okay? We, we will say, 
Well, you know, they're not saved, but they're a good person. I, I know they're not a Christian, but boy, they're, they're really nice. And we, we want to rationalize that away because it's hard for us to say they're a child of Satan. They're a child of the devil. Jesus looked at folks one day in John 8, 44 and said, Ye are of your father, the devil. And the works of your father you'll do. He's pretty plain about it. God is making it plain. There needs to be a clear difference between a child of God and a child of Satan. There ought to be an obvious difference. As much as there is light and darkness, righteousness and unrighteousness, Worshiping God and worshiping idols. Just ought to be as plain as the nose on your face. Okay? Now, number three. Number three. You doing all right? We are to be separate from the world. You know, the world is a source of great danger to the soul of the believer. The world is a source of great danger to the soul of a believer. Now, by the world, I'm not talking about the material world itself, the, the earth on which we live and move and have our being, the earth that God created. We're not saying that God created things that are bad for us. We're not saying that. The sun, the moon, the stars, the valleys, the plains, the seas, the lakes, the rivers, the animals, the vegetation, all of that is good. When we're talking about the world, we're talking about the people who think mainly or chiefly about the world's things and they neglect the world to come. People who are always thinking more of earth than they are of heaven. People who are always thinking more about pleasing man than they are pleasing God. It's their ways and their habits and their customs and their opinions and their practices and their tastes and their aims and their spirit and their attitude. That's the world that Paul tells the Corinthians, come out from among them and be ye separate. Romans 12, verse 2, tells us to be not conformed to what? This world. But to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed. The word conformed is, is poured into a mold. The world would like to pour us all into the same mold. They, they call it what's acceptable to society. They'll call it uh, political correctness. If you don't accept things the way they think you should accept them, you need to undergo some sensitivity training. You need some additional teaching and counseling. Somebody, somebody made the statement, oh, they just brainwash you down at that church. You know, I'm brainwashed by that book right there. I'll, I'll, I'll plead guilty to that. I am. Because the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm to, I'm to think on these things. And, and you, your living doesn't change till your thinking changes. So your thinking has to change. And, and we can, listen, conforming to the world, not being separate from the world, isn't just, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with those that do. It, it involves that. But that's not separation. All, that, that isn't the whole nut of separation. That's not it. You know, you can you not do all those outward things and be conformed to the world in your own mind because you're thinking like the world thinks. You have habits like the world has. First Corinthians 2 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. Aren't you glad you're in church tonight? Wow. Oh, I hope you mean that. 
1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Paul writes to the Corinthians again. He says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He's saying, listen, you, you haven't received... God, God didn't give you the Spirit of the world. If you're following the Spirit of the world, the attitude of the world, you're never going to know the things of God. You have to follow the Spirit of God. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit. To help us. What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4? Galatians 1 and verse 4 says, Who gave Himself for us, that's Jesus Christ. Now watch, that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Why did Christ give Himself for us? To deliver us from hell. Well, He did. But He also gave Himself for us to deliver us from this present evil world. It's not just a matter of, hey man, I'm not going to hell. That's all that matters. No, what matters is also that you're delivered from this present evil world. That means the world in which we live. And by the way, if their world was evil, where's ours? <laughs> way over where theirs was. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Talking about the world here. And you, verse 1, hath he quickened, quickened means made alive, okay, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past, when ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the power of the, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice, we walked according to the course of this world. It means you, you would not, it's a, you, you walked like an unsaved person would walk. But he's saying, that's what you used to walk like. You don't walk that course anymore. You see, there's going to be a difference now that you have been made alive in Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say about Demas in Timothy 4 verse 10? 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me having what? Loved this present world. Wait a minute. Didn't Christ die to deliver us from this present world? Demas turned it around and he loved this present world. And when he loved this present world, he didn't even want to work for Paul. He didn't want to work for the guy who God used to write half the New Testament. He didn't want to have anything to do with maybe outside of Christ walking this earth, maybe the greatest Christian that walked the face of the earth. Maybe... Maybe that's why you don't enjoy church. Because you still love this present world. Let's look at what James says. Go to the book of James. James. James 1. James 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. What's our pure religion? To keep ourselves unspotted from the world. James 4 and verse 4. James 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world 
is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's an amazing verse, by the way. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. At least some of you are giving your Bible a workout tonight. 1 John chapter 2. Here's what the Apostle John says. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Love not the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Go back to that illustration with the world. The world getting further and further away. World, would you stand up here for a minute real quick? World, that'd be you. Huh? The world further and further away. Okay? He doesn't know the believer. The world, and listen, the kind of Christianity that just keeps its distance. Oh, I'm still, I'm still different, but you know what? I'm where the world used to be. And so some of the world looks at me and thinks, you're pretty cool. Yeah, you're pretty cool. Man, I like your music. I like the way you jive. You guys really get it on, man. You see? That's foreign to the Bible. The Bible says the world doesn't even know the don't even know the Christian because we're way over here. Hard to get to know somebody way over there. That's the way it's supposed to be. Thank you. Look at 1 John 5 and verse, I'm sorry, verse, 1 John 4, verse number 5. They are of the world Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Talking about they are that are of the world, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Think about what you talk about. 1 John 5 and verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh what? The world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world, what? Lieth in wickedness. Now let's talk about what Jesus would say. Go to the Gospel of Matthew. What would Jesus say about the world? Look at Matthew 13, will you please? Matthew chapter 13. This is uh, Jesus giving the parable of the sower. And he talks about the one that received the seed among the thorns. Verse 22. Matthew 13 verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world. And the seedfulness of riches, what, what, the, what, what will the care of this world do? Choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. It'll choke the word right out of your, out of your life. John chapter 8 and verse 28. The Gospel of John 8 and verse 28. What else did Jesus say about the world? Jesus said in John 8 and verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing... That's not what I'm looking for. I put the wrong verse down. 
Well, let's see. I'm looking for the verse that says, I am not ye are of this world, but I am not of this world. I must not be. It must not be John 8, 28, because that's what I was reading. Anybody know where that is offhand? Let's see. No. Well, I'll find it. I'll throw it in next week for you, okay? Let's go to John 15, 18. See if I got that one right. Is it 23? There we go. Thank you. 8, 23. There it is. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. That's what you had, Quentin, wasn't it? I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. Hmm. Now look at John 15, verse 18. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world, what? Hate you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. Where, where's, the, where's the Christianity that wants to be recognized by the world? Where, where do you find that in the Bible? That I want to I wanna get a, awards. I want the world to recognize my singing achievements. And, well, the world gives out their awards, so we'll have to give out Christian awards. See? We're, just, we're just doing what the world does. See? Be ye separate. Verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world, world isn't going to think kindly of Christians who live like Jesus Christ. Jesus said it would be that way. What did he say in chapter 16? And I think it's the last verse, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have what? Tribulation. Tribulation's trouble. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You could just read those texts and not comment on them at all. And you would obviously see that the world is the enemy to the Christian. That there is an opposition between the friendship of the world and the friendship of Christ. If you can't look at those verses and see that, you're blind in one eye and you can't see out of the other. It's that plain. I think it's as clear as the Sun at noon. Nothing will damage a believer as much as the world will. It's not just open sin. It's not unbelief which will rob Christ of His professing servants as much as it is love of the world, fear of the world, cares of the world, the business of the world, the money of the world, the pleasures of the world, the desires to keep in, in touch with the world. It is the great rock upon many Christians have made shipwreck. The world. They don't object to anything, any article of the Christian faith. They would tell you they believe in Jesus, that He's the Son of God, the Bible's the Word of God, and, and you ought to uh, be in church. They, they would say all of that, and they would hope to, to, to get to heaven at last. They're not uh, openly rebelling against God. But they can't give up the world.
They begin with Abraham and Moses, but they end with Demas and Lot's wife because they love this present world. Well, that's all the further I get tonight, okay? We'll start with A next Wednesday night. And hopefully I can get through the rest of that next Wednesday evening. Okay? Uh, there's, just, there's just so much to cover. But I'm going to talk about next week. We'll talk about refuse to be guided by the world standard of right and wrong. We'll talk about being careful about your leisure time. We'll talk next week about abstaining from amusements or recreations that are connected with sin. We'll talk about our relationships with worldly people. And we'll talk about how separation is a matter of the heart. And then we'll talk about how separation affects our relationship with God. Okay? That's all coming up next week if we can fit it all into that time. Okay? But I trust we can. All right, let's stand together, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this great doctrine of separation. And Lord, once again, we've seen the, the standard of your word that you've given to us. And I pray, Lord, there would be a great difference in our life and the life of the unbeliever. Lord, I believe the attraction of Christianity has to be in the difference. The world, at some point, those in the world know that they don't have the answers. They don't have peace. They don't have satisfaction. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're taking medications. They have trouble sleeping. They know there's got to be something else. May they see that in the lives of believers. May it be as obvious to them as light and dark. And I pray we would be separate unto you. May others see Christ in us this week is our prayer. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. All right? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you.